Released by Konami in 2006 on the Nintendo DS, Castlevania Portrait of Ruin would take place in between Castlevania Bloodlines and Castlevania Ari of Sorrow. Directed by Satoshi Kushibuchi and written by Koji Igarashi, Hiroto Yamaguchi, and Shutaro Ida, the game features being able to switch between two characters at the same time or use them simultaneously with a separate cooperative multiplayer mode while celebrating the series' 20th anniversary. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the game begins, it's 1944 and the world is still suffering under the chaos of World War II. The anguish and anger of millions around the world summon the legendary Castlevania, bringing with it dark intent to push humanity completely into ruin. At this time, two powerful witches named Stella and Loretta approach the castle, sensing something wrong with their father who has already gone inside. Levitating through Castlevania, the girls are more than strong enough to easily annihilate any defenses of the castle while noticing curious paintings along the way. Entering a studio painting, they find their father dying on the floor as he shouts out to a vampire named Bronner that appears behind Stella. He quickly bites her and turns to Loretta, calling them his daughters, promising them world peace before he bites her too. Shortly after, we see Jonathan Morris, son of John Morris, is the current wielder of the famed vampire killer Whip. However, the sharp tongue of his childhood friend and gifted witch Charlotte Olin reveals he is actually unable to use it. Explaining to a concerned priest and merchant named Vincent, they explain that even though the Morris clan is related to the Belmont clan by blood, they are not direct descendants and cannot unlock the full power of the legendary Whip. All the same, an optimistic and self-assured Jonathan is confident in their strength, verifying the castle ahead is actually Dracula's castle and the duo dash inside. Outrunning a behemoth corpse, the duo's tag teamwork traverse the obstacles in their way, running into a ghost of a man that chooses to remain nameless. Charlotte is impressed the ghost is able to retain his consciousness, and is curious how he somehow knows Jonathan cannot truly wield the vampire killer. He reveals before he died, he cast a barrier on himself, binding his soul to this place, so though he is immune to the castle's influence, he is trapped here. Charlotte knows it takes more than a simple barrier to accomplish that, wondering who he really is, and he replies that they can just call him Wind for now. He adds his soul will not rest until this castle's lord is defeated, and is willing to grant items and techniques he possessed in life to those who fight the vampire lord. Arrogantly, Jonathan declines Wynne's help, but Charlotte warns him about underestimating Castlevania or relying on the vampire killer, reminding him that he could die from the whip just like his father. Jonathan reflexively lashes out in anger at the mention of his father, wanting to forget him, but calming down sees reason and asks Wynne for help. Wynne then clarifies this castle's lord is not Dracula, and even though it is Dracula's castle, it is another vampire named Bronner. Bronner is an artist as well as a powerful magician, and using magic in the paintings to increase his power and make the castle's power his own. Finding one such painting, Charlotte observes Bronner is using it to directly control the power of Castlevania, but it's also a paranormal phenomenon they cannot destroy through conventional means. However, as they are pocket dimensions with their own regenerating barriers, she theorizes she can use her magic to enable them to enter the painting and collapse the magic from within. Transported inside, they find art literally reflects reality here as the will of the artist is embodied in this painted city. Hurrying through the city of Haze, they pass marketplaces and tunnel systems until they find and destroy a daunting Dullahan. With this, Charlotte notices the monster was the core of the magic energy, and defeating it diminished Bronner's hold of the castle a little bit. Just then, they are met by a young vampire who introduces herself as Loretta and flaunts that they only destroyed one of many of her father's paintings. Bracing himself to slay her now, Jonathan is unexpectedly halted by Vampire Killer itself, and laughing, Loretta states she also has orders not to fight them now as she leaves. Exiting the Victorian venue for now, the witch indeed senses more paintings, and after they rip through another rotting behemoth, they are met by Dracula's servant, Death. Death asserts this castle always has and always will be Dracula's, and the ownership of Bronner is news to him, wondering why he did not sense it. All the same, Jonathan challenges the Grim Reaper, but Death laughs in his face, stating his father John Morris was much stronger than him and he's dead, and Jonathan is tilted by the comparison. Charlotte holds him back and questions where the anger is coming from, and Jonathan cannot get over how his father only taught him the basics of battle before dying, and resents inheriting a powerful relic he cannot use. This adds to how he's also frustrated Dracula may be reviving and has not yet learned to use his hidden power. Moving on, the duo beat Karim at the Blob, delving into a cave system hiding under the portrait. Emerging in an arid Egyptian desert, the duo cross the dunes and tombs, explore the sandy graves, and face down Phantom Pharaohs. Avoiding traps that almost turn them into a sandwich, they run into Bronner alongside Stella, who is surprised to see them inside the painting too. The hunters ask if he intends to revive Dracula, and Bronner confesses he has no intention to. He elaborates that he's tired of waiting for centuries for Dracula to revive just to fail at controlling humanity and get put down over and over. Rather, he intends to take the world from the humans that are ruining its beauty with his own hands. 
Still, he recognizes Dracula's power is great and has raised the castle in order to channel its power for his purpose. Charlotte questions how it's possible to separate Dracula from his magic and Bronner boasts his paintings can do exactly that. He lets the duo go, sensing death is snooping around the castle and prioritizes his destruction. Seeing Bronner is beyond their ability now, the group considers themselves lucky, slashing past sandworms and shutting down Astarte to sabotage one more painting. Back in the castle, Jonathan and Charlotte climb to the roof to find another painting, this time a macabre carnival in the ruins of a twisted city where the entire town is spun madly on its side or upside down. At its center, a legion rains down cadavers until the team cracks its core to create one more chink in Bronner's armor. As they exit, Stella waits to ambush them, impatient to kill them now, but as the vampire hunters edge out a win, Stella falls, somehow reverting back to a human temporarily. Before he can finish her off, Loretta saves her sister, pulling her out for now, but warning the pair to stop here. After the girls leave, Jonathan spots a dropped locket and is surprised to find a family photo of his sisters with Wind. Riding a pair of motorized skateboards back to Wynn, they ask him about the photo, and seeing this, Wynn decides to come clean. He reveals his real name is Eric Lacard, the same man who fought alongside his best friend and Jonathan's father, John Morris, and Stella and Loretta are actually his daughters, not Bronner's. Bronner lost his real daughters in World War I, and in his grief, awakened a new power he used to become a vampire. He then stole Eric's daughters, thinking they were reborn versions of his own, and Jonathan thinks them being of the Lacard family is why Vampire Killer halted him from striking them earlier. Charlotte asks Eric if he knows how to unlock the Vampire Killer's power, and Eric says he does, elaborating that in order for a member of the Morris family to use the Vampire Killer, they need the power of the Lacard family. Unfortunately, he cannot help as a ghost, nor can his daughters as vampires, and Jonathan sulks that the whip is useless. With a sigh, Eric says he was forbidden to reveal this, but explains that the story that John died from wounds from Dracula is not true. Rather, for anyone who is not a pure-blood Belmont, in order to use the true power of the Vampire Killer, they must give up a part of their own life. The Lacard family can act as the power's key for when it's truly necessary, but the fact of the matter is, John died due to overuse of the whip, which is why he didn't want to teach his son how to use it. In the end, John was looking out for his son, and realizing this, Jonathan lets go of his anger at his father, but now demands to know why the Belmonts passed the whip onto the Morris family to begin with. Eric explains the Belmonts cannot touch the whip now, and must not, until Dracula's predicted resurrection in the year 1999, and in the meanwhile, it's up to the Morris family to safeguard it and stop the underworld monsters. Forced to accept this, Jonathan wonders what they're going to do about Eric's daughters, and Charlotte suggests trying a purification spell to reverse their transformation, but Eric is doubtful about such a measure. Climbing the Tower of Death, the duo finds the next portrait on the terrace of a water wheel, entering it to find themselves deep in a forest of doom, ridding a mansion of the evils residing within. Descending into the dismal depths of the deadly dungeon, the duo deal with the deep darkness before diving down to destroy a Dagon. Another painting ruined, the pair run into Death again, who denies Jonathan's challenge, repeating he has nothing to do with Bronner. Charlotte counters he is directly involved with Dracula's resurrection, and after clashing, Death admits the pair is stronger than he thought, even without the whip, but tells them they have a task to accomplish first before they get too self-confident. As Death parts ways, the pair talks more with Eric, who shares John learned the Vampire Killer would consume his life only after Dracula was defeated and confirmed it with magic after noticing he took much longer than normal to recover. Jonathan then wonders if his grandfather Quincy Morris knew of the curse when John inherited the whip, and Eric doubts it. They are interrupted by Panic Vincent who declares he's been bitten by a vampire, and Charlotte says there is still time to purify him before he turns, able to do so on her own. Returning to their exploration of Castlevania, up in the Master's Key, the pair run into the Lacard sisters, and Jonathan quickly tells them they are being tricked by Bronner. Unfortunately, this falls on deaf ears, and though the girls try to defeat the duo, Jonathan buys enough time for Charlotte to finish her purification spell, and succeeding, Loretta and Stella are restored of their humanity. Though their memory of recent events is foggy, they recognize Jonathan and the Vampire Killer Whip, apologizing for their actions and thankful for the rescue. Exhausted but properly introducing themselves, the sisters know they have no time to waste in stopping Bronner, who is about to finish his latest piece meant to destroy the world. Their magic can get them access to the sealed painting, and while they do know the ritual to unlock the power of the Vampire Killer, Jonathan should only use it when he is ready to pay the sole price. The warrior accepts, and the girls explain during the ritual he must now defeat the memory of the last pureblood Belmont to wield the whip to prove his worthiness, and Jonathan finds he is pit against the ghost of Richter Belmont. Edging out a win, Jonathan is recognized by the vampire killer, in awe of its unleashed power, and is reminded not to overuse it. Returning to Eric, they report the restoration of his daughters, and Eric is incredulous, and agrees with their choice to hold off on a reunion. 
Moving on to Bronner's studio, Jonathan sees the four smaller portraits protecting the main piece, each one a deadlier version of familiar locations guarded by the legendary lineup of the werewolf, Frankenstein's creature, the mummy man, and Medusa. Surprising Bronner at his supposed safe space, he is outraged to learn Stella and Loretta have been returned to normal, claiming they are his reincarnated daughters. Jonathan is fast to counter that family is more than blood, and is the people in your life who want you and theirs, furious on Bronner's use of a curse to manipulate the girls. Trembling with rage, Bronner snaps, unleashing the power of his painting as what's depicted on the canvas materializes in reality. However, the vampire artist falls, cursing humanity for starting wars and ruining the world, and spitting out that while he may have been wrong, he'll never admit the duo was right. Jonathan says he can live with that, since justice for anyone is just a matter of perspective, but the fact still remains Bronner was a coward trying to reject reality and substitute his own. Defeated, Bronner comments he just wanted to protect his family, but in an instant, he is cut down by Death who thanks the duo for setting him up for the easy cleanup. Death adds the studio painting was cutting off the throne needed to revive Dracula and leaves while the duo pursue him into a painting of a red carpeted stairway. Preparing for the final battle, the duo finds one more hidden portrait and find it to be an ensemble of enemies from days past collected in a nest of evil. Thrashing Balor, beating Gurgoth, pummeling Zephyr, hammering Agni, and subduing Abaddon, the duo now faces off against cruel caricatures of the legendary trio Grant and Asti, Saifa Belnades, and Trevor Belmont. Overcoming themselves in the final struggle, the pair earn the aid of heroes by their side as they finally approach the Lord of Darkness. Casually tossing a glass their way, Dracula suggests they make this a real 2v2, as the Reaper relentlessly hounds the pair during the fight as Dracula carpets the area with deadly sorcery. The Hunters strike down Death first, prompting him to send his power to the Vampire Lord who collects it through Soul Steel, ascending into a true demon form, and oppresses the young Hunters with crushing power. Overcoming the dynamic team up with their own trust and power, Jonathan and Charlotte stand victorious over Dracula, who declares he knows one day his power will be fully revived. As the game ends, the sun rises on a new day, as the group watches Castlevania crumble from a distance. Eric congratulates them on a job well done and tells his daughters he's glad he could see them again, telling them to live their best life now before passing on. Charlotte thanks him for his mentorship, and after the sisters grieve for their father, the girls promise to get stronger and help the hunters going forward. Castlevania Portrait of Ruin has enjoyed the success of selling over 400,000 copies worldwide. This is considered one of the top Castlevania titles and for good reason, so let me know if you got to play it. If you enjoyed the recap, then leave a like, and big thanks to the patron and channel member Hunters. Check out the links in the description for ways to support the channel, or places like my Discord server. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next battlefield.